I write obviously in the colonizer's tongue and I still enjoy that writing. For me it's sort of, um, I enjoy it because I'm writing, I'm using the colonizer's language to write about what they have done to us. And then I get to, and then that, that written piece about assimilation or colonisation or attempted genocide or the struggle for survival, which is all in the anthology, then goes back to the UK for readers over there to read. So to me, there's some sense of joy in that. And I think, um, I don't know that most writers or many writers sit down expecting to get joy out of their writing. I think for a lot of Aboriginal authors, which, you're, which are in our anthology, um, use writing as a form of catharsis. They use it as a means to make sure that their voice has a place in Australian literature. They use, it, they use their writing as a means of having a political voice in a country where we still remain voices in the political system, where the arts are the only political platform we have, where literature remains a highly political tool, whether it's writing songs about the stolen generations, whether it's Archie Roach, whether it's Yothi Yindi writing Treaty, whether it's Brown Skin Baby by Bobby Randall, or the story of Vincent Lingari with um, From Little Things Big Things Grow, or whether it's play excerpts, or whether it's novels like Lisa Barrent's Home about Stolen Generations or Rabbit Proof Follow the Rabbit Proof Fence by Annie Doris Pilkington. I think uh, the writers sit down with a purpose, our writers sit down with a purpose. It's not necessarily about sitting and staring out the window and writing every metaphor for butterfly and tree and sex. Mm. There is a distinct purpose of getting a story written down, of having a political place in this country of making sure that we have our own self-representation because obviously for two centuries people have been representing us in Australian literature and it's about saying well hang on this is how we are this is who we are this is how we view ourselves and these are our aspirations regardless of what you may think so I think for me and for what readers will, will see and hopefully understand through reading the bios and then reading the text is that they will see that there are some distinct differences between um, style and language, motivation and content between the Indigenous or the Aboriginal and the non-Aboriginal writing. The interesting thing about storytelling, um, or being a storyteller I guess, is that you, you don't assume the position of being a great storyteller. I think that's, um, that's a badge that's given to you. If, you're, if you are capable of actually telling a good yarn or, you, know, or you, you, you are a storyteller in my communities, you're a storyteller because you've been given the stories to tell. Um, and I think the difference between, to me there's an absolutely obvious difference between Aboriginal stories on the page and non-Aboriginal stories on the page because when you read um, particularly earlier works of Aboriginal writing you will see that there's very little difference between the spoken word and the written word. People like Ruby Langford Guinnaby is a classic example of very conversational style that literally the oral form is just digested onto the page whereas non-Aboriginal writing is edited to conform to a, a particular literary style. And I think, to me, there's, I, I, I prefer to read something that's written conversationally. I, th I think it's easier, easier to read and I think it's easy for children to read. Um, and I, to me, there's, there's a great difference between the, the written and the spoken word for non-Aboriginal literature, where there's not. Like our, it, it, the storytelling orally is, is actually just purged onto the page.